Welcome to church this Sunday morning. My name is Pastor Andrew Wilson, and we're thankful to have you join us here for worship at Trinity Lutheran Church in downtown Zanesville, Ohio. We've entered a new month, the month of October. It's hard to believe, uh, and yet we thank the Lord that He continues to be with us through this time of, of pandemic and uncertainty. We thank the Lord also that He continues to bless us with the opportunity to meet together for worship, both in person in a safe manner, but also right here on our YouTube channel uh, to be able to hear God's Word, to receive His forgiveness, to rejoice anew at all that God has done for us in Jesus Christ, our Savior. We're glad you're with us to do that this morning as well. As it is a new month, that means a new verse that we have to learn uh, for this month of October. And so I invite you to join with me as we speak it together this morning. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Philippians 4, verse 8. And as we begin, let's do so with a word of opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you yet again for this time to worship you, to hear your word, and to grow together in our faith. Lord, from your word today, we pray that you would show us clearly what is the most important thing for us to know as Christians. And then, having seen that in your word, we pray that you'd lead us to grow in that and to grow together in our faith. We pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. We make our beginning today, then, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, to call upon him in prayer and praise, and to rejoice at what God has done for us through Christ, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We take a moment of silent and personal confession of our sin. And together we confess, Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. And now, brothers and sisters in Christ, hear this good news of God's mercy and grace that is spoken to you. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you of all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you of all of your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, you gave your Son into the hands of sinful men who killed him. Forgive us when we reject your unfailing love and grant us the fullness of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading today comes to us from the Old Testament and the prophet Isaiah, chapter 5 and beginning at verse 1. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it, 
and he hewed out a wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading today comes to us from Paul's letter to the Philippians chapter 3 and beginning at verse 4b. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, Forgetting what lies behind and straining toward what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, Hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a winepress in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. And Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the Scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds, because they held him to be a prophet. 
This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. At this time we sing together our hymn of the day, How Firm a Foundation. As always, we encourage you to join along as we sing it together this morning. And God bless our meditation together on his word for us from our epistle lesson in Philippians chapter 3 as we seek to understand the most important part of our Christian life and as we seek to grow together in our faith. Have you ever considered this question, what is the most important thing for us to know as Christians? Is it a certain event in the history of the church? Is it a certain Bible verse or a story? Is it a deep theological topic like the Gainus Maestaticum? Or is it something else? Well, it is certainly important to know the history of the Christian church on earth, and it is certainly important to know God's Word and the accounts that we find there. And seminary-level theological topics like the Gainus Maestaticum, they are good to know about too. But Paul writes to the Philippian Christians about just this topic in our epistle reading for today, and and he doesn't list any of those things as being the most important. In fact, Paul says that all the knowledge in the world, all the seminary degrees that could fit on a wall, all the Bible quiz bowl championship trophies, all of that can't compare to this, verses 7 and 8. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. What is the most important thing for us to know as Christians? Paul shows us the answer. It's Jesus. But what does that mean? Well, let's play a game to try and help us find out. Do you know these Ohio people? Raise your hand at home if uh, you know this guy. Yeah, that's right. Mike DeWine. Well, raise your hand if you know this guy. That's right. It's Joe Burrow. Well, one last one. Raise your hand if you know this individual. Well, of course. It's Brutus. Congratulations. Most of you, I think, probably went three for three there at home. And 
And you know what? I would go so far as to say that you don't only know who these people are, but that you also likely know a good little bit about each of them too. You probably could tell me that Mike DeWine is the governor of our state. You might also be able to tell me that his wife is named Fran. And if you have watched enough of his coronavirus press conferences, you might also be able to tell me a little bit about his collection of ties and masks that feature schools and sports teams from all across our state. What about Joe Burrow? I bet you could tell me more about him as well. Maybe that he played football at Athens High School or that he won a national championship last year at LSU, or that he is now the starting quarterback of the Cincinnati Bengals. And Brutus, I know that most of you could tell me a lot more about him, a lot more than anyone might possibly think is possible of a nut. So it's pretty clear. You don't only know who these individuals are. You know a lot more about them, too. But do you really know them? If they saw you walking down the street, would they wave and call you by name? If they saw your phone number come up on their caller ID, would they pick up and say hello? When you exchange Christmas cards in a few months, will these individuals get one from you? And will you get a personal note back from them? For most of us, the answer is the same. Likely not. You see, we can know of or about these individuals with a head knowledge, but do we have a relationship with them? Do we truly know them? For most of us, probably not. Here in Philippians, Paul is trying to show his readers this clear truth that the most important part of the Christian life isn't your credentials, and it's not what you know about either, but rather it's about knowing Jesus. Not just having head knowledge, but the heart knowledge that only comes from a relationship. In this way, even though it's cliche to say, it's also true. Christianity is not so much a religion as it is a relationship. And our relationship with Jesus matters. In fact, it's the most important thing. So how well do each of us do with keeping up that relationship? You know, when a friend sends you a message after message and you leave them unread in your inbox, that doesn't help your relationship. It hurts it. When a friend calls you on the phone and leaves you voicemail after voicemail that you never return, that doesn't help your relationship. It hurts it. When a friend shares with you words of wisdom and direction and you ignore them altogether, or even worse, you do the exact opposite of what they say, that doesn't help your relationship. It hurts it. None of these actions help grow a relationship. Rather, each and every one of them hurts the relationship instead. And yet, don't we do things just like this when it comes to Jesus? God has given us his word to read and hear regularly, like a message from a friend, but we so often leave it unread and on the shelf, like it doesn't much matter. God desires that we communicate with him, calling on him in prayer, but it's often like we leave his voicemails unreturned. And though God provides us direction and counsel through his word on how we are to live and serve him and others, we often follow our own personal advice instead. The most important thing about being a Christian is being in a relationship with Jesus. I'm afraid we don't always do very well at all at that. And with that truth staring back at us this morning, I know what our first instinctual response might be. But, but pastor, I'm a lifelong Lutheran. That has to matter more than this relationship. But pastor, I've served on the council, the elders, the altar guild, the trustees, the board of this, and the board of that, too. That has to matter more than this relationship. 
But pastor, I've taught Sunday school and served at Christ's table and volunteered my time and shared my talents and given my treasure. All of that has to matter more than this relationship. And yet what does Paul say at the beginning of our reading? If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. And then Paul lists all of his religious credentials And then he tells us how much they really matter. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. What matters most for us as Christians? Our relationship with Jesus. And though in our sin we do so much that hurts that relationship, thanks be to God that He has made it a relationship that lasts. For though we fail in knowing Jesus as we should, God knows us. He knows who you are. He created you after all. He knows all about you too. That means the good and the bad and everything in between. And yet, He loves you still. In fact, He loves you so much that He sent His only Son to earth to die on the cross so that you would be forgiven. And in his love, he made sure that you would always be in relationship with him. How did he do that? He adopted you. He adopted you by your baptism and made you his sons and daughters. He made you a part of his family. He put his name on your heart. That means even when you utterly fail at holding up your end of the relationship, God still loves you just as much. Even when you fail to read His Word, God still offers it to you again and again by His grace for your strength and your blessing. And when your prayer life falters, God doesn't stop listening to you or graciously inviting you to speak to Him. When you and I fall short of how we are to live, God doesn't kick us out of His family because we are a part of His family by His grace. And so he loves and forgives us in Christ instead. In Christ Jesus, who makes us righteous not by our credentials, but by faith in him. And that faith leads us forward. Leads us forward to not keep living as if our relationship with Jesus doesn't matter, but rather it leads us to live like it matters most of all. Because it does. So may God strengthen us us as we seek to know Jesus more and more, to hear his word, to respond in prayer, to live by faith in the Son of God who has saved us by his grace, in Jesus who has made us his own. In Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen. Having heard God's word proclaimed, let us confess together our Christian faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Merciful Lord, you have planted us as your own vineyard, that we might bear good fruit for your glory. Grant to us grace that we may be faithful and show forth in our lives the good works that glorify you and serve your purpose. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Lord, rescue us from all enemies of your church, And bless us with church leaders whose voices will not waver in the face of threat. Bless Matthew, the president of the Synod.
Kevin, our district president, Danny, our circuit visitor, and all pastors who serve. Inspire men and women to go into church work vocations and bless those preparing for church work now. We also pray for those congregations we walk together with in our church body. And today, by name, we pray for St. John Lutheran Church in Dover, Delaware. We pray for their pastor, their staff, and all of their members, that they would be reminded of the most important thing, and that together they would grow in relationship with Jesus our Savior. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Mighty Lord, give to the nations both the desire for and the blessing of peace. Thwart the actions of terrorists and those who would oppress with the power of fear. Bless our president, our governor, and all who pass, enforce, and judge our laws. Spare us from disease and fear. Deliver the poor from want and help us to provide jobs and worthy employment for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Everlasting Father, guide husbands and wives to love and forgive each other and strengthen them in their lives together. Bless the homes in which your people dwell. Help parents to be faithful examples for their children and give room in their hearts and homes so that orphans may know the joy of a place and a home to call their own. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of love, deliver the sick from their illnesses. Give relief to those who suffer. Help the troubled to know peace of mind and be with the grieving and those who are in their final days. Guide all health care professionals to serve those in need and give patience to those who must bear with their infirmities, disabilities, and infertilities. Hear us especially as we pray for these individuals from our congregation and community during their time of need, for Kathy and her family, for Kim, Randy, Pippi, John, Gary, Anne, Gary, Bill, Jim, Myra, Marianne, Freya, Logan, Jeff, Amanda, Patricia, Richard, Melanie, Jacob, Emily, Myla, Libby, Delbert, Payne, Wesley, Dorothy, Shirley, Tom, Sharon, Rachel, and all others who are in need. Lord, we pray that you would grant these individuals healing according to your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also pray this day for those who celebrate, especially Jim and Ruth Ann Brown, as they celebrate 57 years of marriage. And just as you have blessed them, Lord, in the years gone by, we pray your continued blessings upon them in the years to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, give us a willing spirit that we may serve you with all that we have and all that we are. Help us to be faithful and fruitful in the godly use of your resources and gifts, that we may use them in accord with your will and for your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear us, O Lord, and give answer to the prayers of your people, prayed in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ whom with the Father and the Spirit you are one God and one Lord forevermore. And so hear us as together we pray our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the Lord's blessing upon you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.